Today, I'm going on a sartorial journey with philanthropist, designer, and mother of five, the wonderful India Hicks. India is the daughter of the celebrated interior designer David Hicks and Lady Pamela Mountbatten, a lady-in-waiting to the late Queen. She's a goddaughter of the King, was a bridesmaid to Lady Diana Spencer, resides in Harbour Island, the Bahamas, with her husband, David Flintwood, and their five children. India studied photography at the New England School of Photography, but quickly found herself on the other side of the lens as a model. In the 90s, her quintessential English aristocratic look caught the eye of Ralph Lauren, and the rest, as they say, is history. I first met India back in the 90s when she walked in one of my London Fashion Week shows. I can, cl I can clearly remember the look she was in, and I did my best to try and find a couple of images of her that in that show, but this was the pre, pre the digital revolution, and so regretfully, not quite as easy to pull up. Hicks travels frequently to disaster sites in her role with the non-profit organization Global Empowerment Mission. Most recently, she's been in the Ukraine. She's also patron of the Prince's Trust. Welcome, my globe-trotting friend, India. So good to see you here in London. Uh, your life appears to be one whirlwind of travel interspersed with stints at home on Harbour Island, all gloriously documented on your Instagram feed. So what have been the particular highlights of the last month or so? Goodness, you've been particularly, we're both using that lovely word, particularly, particularly, this, this month's been uh, hectic. I'm not sure why, I think just everything kind of came after Christmas. Um, I had a trip that was planned uh, to go back to Ukraine, I've been three times, and I was meant to go back in September, and then our Queen died, and I stayed to be with my mum, uh, because I wondered what the effect was going to be on her, whether that would be the closing of a chapter that might um, destabilise her in some way. Actually, it didn't at all. She kind of, I think, felt, right, if she died at 96, I'm 93, I've got three more years. It had the reverse effect. It's a really resilient generation, isn't Amazing. it? Amazing. Amazing. They're war babies. They yeah. live through wars. So, actually, I went to Ukraine this January um, to go back to to see the people that I had been in touch with and to kind of finish a, a journey that I had been on, although that... The, the foundation that I work with are absolutely there. They remain there. They're an extraordinary foundation because it's all about empowerment. That word is used in their title. And so they put people, uh, groups, and teams together who are from that country, who are on the ground, who are then... So there's no kind of... Um, it feels very um, sustainable for a start, and, and they understand what they're doing. And it's much better that you have people who... Uh, from the country, working for the country. One of the first times I went, just after the invasion, so nearly a year ago, we went to the uh, Polish-Ukrainian border where the refugee um, sort of crisis was happening, and it was a crisis at the time. Um, the yes, I remember. It was only three weeks, uh, three weeks into it, and um, it was it was absolutely shocking from from every point of view. But it was very. It was very revealing working with Ukrainians and working with Polish people. Um, although the language barrier was, was virtually impossible, people were just not speaking English, so it was very hard. But I had travelled with a Polish girlfriend, so she was actually our translator for a lot of the time. But very difficult trips, very difficult. So that's, that was this January. I went back because um, uh, last May I was there again, and I met a lot of people, and we were saying, we're going to come back and rebuild your apartment buildings. I think it's very important that one sort of sets, sets the standard of hope in these not only war-torn countries, but also disaster areas. So if you've been through a tornado, if you're going through an earthquake, if you've been through a hurricane, what people need to know and feel is that they are not forgotten and that people are there for them. Because working with a disaster relief agency, it's always very immediate. The immediate thing, everybody's there, the Red Cross is there, um, that they're there immediately. It's, the, it's needing to stay on the ground and help. So when I went back in May, we went to this wonderful apartment building. We met a fantastic priest and a lovely old lady called Anna. Extraordinary characters who I got to know. And then this January, we went back to see them back in their houses. The house had been rebuilt, this whole apartment building. And that was a tiny, tiny example of the much bigger picture that Global Empowerment is tackling right now. Um, they're also, obviously, in Turkey as I speak. How did you get involved with Global Empowerment? I feel we're cheating slightly because it's nothing to do with style, but it's very important for me, and I'm glad yes, you're asking. Yes, it's Thank an important you. part of your life. Um, very important now, and all, all, as is style, but this po po possibly a little bit more important. 
Um, I, we were talking earlier about losing businesses, and I, for six years, had put all my heart and soul into a business. Um, it, it was a lifestyle brand, and we sold through a, a network of wonderful, wonderful women, and we were all empowering each other, and we were, had all reached a certain age where our children were leaving home, and we were looking for something more to do, and we learned how to do our tax returns, and we were suddenly earning money, and it was all fantastic together, and then I lost the business. And I felt terrible humiliation and complete confusion. I couldn't understand how I could lose a business that I was so passionate about. And I knew it was working. We were developing beautiful product. That and must yet, have been very shocking. It was. And, and, and I, I know you have obviously on a very different level because you had a, year, a business for 30 years and mine was a very brief interlude in my life. But it was something that I really poured my heart. My, my, I poured myself into it. Uh, I traveled across for America and, and I... I definitely sacrificed parts of my own private life for this business. Um, but it was an amazing learning experience. And the actual, the sort of, the picking yourself up again was, was an, a crucial part of it. And that, for that first couple of weeks during that summer, I went away to learn to kite surf, as you do, Amanda. You learn to go away and kite surf well, with some of my children. You're a fellow adventurer. A I fellow know adventurer. That. And it was called Zero to Hero uh, in three days. Oh, I love that name. Fantastic. My kids became heroes in three days. I was still struggling slightly. But nevertheless, just feeling like that, a hero, I, I hope. I felt like a hero all the way through. My kids were so sweet. They said, come on, Mom. Anyway, after that, um, an appalling, devastating um, hurricane came through the Bahamas, and yeah. it um, obliterated two islands close to us. We yeah. were just 70 miles away, and we were protected uh, by the grace of God. And, and I realized that I had time and energy and contacts with which I could put to good use. Yeah. Um, and so I looked around, and I, I, I worked with several different agencies because I didn't know anything about it to begin with. Um, and then I, 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 I found Global Empowerment Mission, and Michael Capone, who's the founder of it, is a very unique character, um, a, a, an extraordinary, extraordinary man, and he's become a very good friend of mine, um, and I am unbelievably inspired by him on a daily basis of what he does and how he's turned his life around because he was, he was an addict for many years, and he then found... Uh, he found the light and the way, essentially. Uh, and now he dedicates his life to other people. And so I've worked with him um, in the, the Tower Block disaster in Florida. I worked with him on tornadoes um, in Alabama. And I worked with him very closely on the rebuilding of these islands of the Bahamas. And then it was a natural it was a natural step that I sat on their advisory board and now I sit on their executive board. And so we went out to Ukraine and I wanted to be I think, a valuable member of their team. And what can I do, really, when I'm there in Ukraine? I can bring awareness to what they are doing, the people they are rescuing, the lives they are changing. I can also, hopefully, uh, encourage bigger brands. Uniqlo gave us a huge um, uh, donation of warm clothing oh, and tech brilliant. Max, which I took out this January. So lots of different things. And when I'm actually there on the ground showing people what's happening, you get a much bigger... Um, donation you get much bigger response financially to what's going on so for my my small instagram world i'm able to use that to the benefit of of those who are in need but you communicate very very well and i you know i'm i'm very aware of your incredibly powerful and beautiful instagram feed but it's it's not just the beauty of the pictures or the power of the pictures you know, as in the Ukrainian pictures, it's actually how you're communicating and talking about what's happening on the ground that is really, really powerful. So well, that's that's really kind of you. And funnily enough, when I was thinking about today and talking to you about, you know, style, DNA, um, and again, it's sort of is it nature or nurture, the whole thing of style is fascinating, the DNA of it. I think I, I think words are, are are very much part of the creative world, obviously, and and I love now words, although I was totally uneducated. I spent no time paying attention in school. I got the worst grades ever, um, so I shouldn't really be writing at all. But I do love it, and David, my husband, now husband, always says to me that actually Instagram is like sending a postcard. It's, it's, a, it's a picture that you've chosen of a place you've been to or a memory you have or a moment you're having. And you write a few words to go of it and sending news. And that's how I always see it, that I like to write a few words to give people more than just the picture of how I'm feeling and what, what the response has been. It's, it's so true. It really is so true. Um, I, it's funny, I found words to be a wonderful creative outlet. I, I suppose, in a way, that's why I created this podcast. Um, I went from creating beautiful clothes, I thought they were beautiful, um, to really questioning what goes into 
why we dress, how we dress, what makes us feel good, all of that, you know, the DNA side of things. And I have found it an incredible creative outlet. You know, this, this podcast actually started out as the idea for a book. And then I realized that, in fact, it would be far more interesting to have these conversations in person. So here we are today. Um, any surprising moments over the last month? I think it's it's extraordinary the world we're living and, and because of the advent of the internet and, and technology and being in touch with one another and understanding it in you know, the flash of a second what's happening around the world that one can go from a, a, literally a war zone to, to then being back in London and sitting and talking about style. And I think the surprising part of that is is, is sort of managing emotions when I came back from Ukraine this time, and I took two of my children, I've had one with me before, but I took two this time, and they're, you know, I say children, they're sort of 19 and 25-year-old men. Um, I thought it was good for them to really understand what I did, how I worked with the foundation, what the foundation did. And, um, and it, it, it's, it's quite a tough journey, not, not only <laughs> physically. That's it's, a it's, big journey to take it, young men on. It was or a big young, journey. young people on. But then when I came back and I sat with my mum and we went and had a, a lunch together in the pub and I asked her about, she's 93, so I asked her about living through the war. Of course, they lived like that every day for five years. You know, they hid in undergrounds. They listened for the buzz bombs. They counted till the seconds that the missile went off. And that's exactly what we did in Ukraine. We could hear the missiles going overhead. We lo- at night, we woke up with those sirens. Now, I was there for 10 days, and I've done three trips, but still, 10 days, and I know, hopefully, that I'm fairly safe. We're with a security team. We have got bulletproof vests and, and armoured clothing on us and armoured vehicles with us which again, you feel the guilt, you're handing out boxes of aid, very necessary boxes of aid. Do not underestimate what's in that box. You know, there there are battery packs, there are heat pads, there's food for a month, there's blankets, there's torches, there's candles. No one's got any electricity out there. They're just living in constant daily exhaustion of war. And we come back to the safety of our life, to London, to sit and talk about Star. And I think that that is surprising at how one has to adapt and that one does adapt, and that you do adapt. I mean, obviously, my experience is very minimal compared to those who've really suffered out there. But it is, it's, it is I think we, we are all in the world today living through such an extraordinary journey of, of everything, of such, such extremes from climate. And you and I both share a love of Switzerland and Verbier, and, and I was lucky enough to have got five days of my kids skiing there recently. And you see, you see the effects of global climate change happening there before your eyes and there's just everything is so frantic at the moment and and I think that the 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 way we have to adjust is probably the biggest surprise that we're having to adjust so rapidly. So how did you decide what to wear today? Well it's interesting isn't it because I thought oh podcast no problem won't be seen and then um, I think one of your teams said a thing saying just to let you know visual as well as audio so you think twice about it However, I, I, had a <laughs> I had a skiing accident, um, uh, I think. As we do. I, as we do. I think I was going much too fast. I think a young German was going much too fast. I think we were both at fault. So I definitely have some cracked ribs and some very battered and bruised um, legs. And I had a rather un- unattractive cheek for a while. So I'm feeling a little, uh, like, a little tender. Mm-hmm. So I think this is, a, is a probably, these are, these are probably the easy clothes. Cocooning. Cocooning. And interestingly enough, they're... I'm head to toe in J. Crew, and I used to model for J. Crew years and years and years ago. Um, and they've got a new, very dynamic um, uh, person in charge, uh, the creative person. And and they wrote to me and said, you know, we'd we'd love we'd love to have a, a relationship. Um, and so I thought, let's. And I just feel so good. It's so it's one of those brands where you suddenly put the clothes on and you feel totally at ease. Did you choose them? I did. Or, yeah. Yes. I won't let go that fast to choosing what I want. So uh, it, it's a it's super easy black, super easy jeans, unbelievably helpful. I'm quite difficult about jeans. Great cut on the jeans. And even the Birkenstocks are from them. They're Ooh. Birkenstocks, but they sell them. And of course, it's the kind of that dark, dark washed denim colour with the fur that I'm loving so much. And I've been to all sorts of different meetings today in London, and it's worked everywhere. There's something very democratic about Birkenstocks, isn't there? Yeah, it's really good, especially yeah. nowadays. My daughter, who's 15, and she really... She really is, it's interesting to watch 
how she's sort of developing from a tomboy into somebody who's caring about her clothes. But I have to copy her quite a lot. It's awful. It's not the other way around. She's not copying me. I Is copy her. Is she conscious her. of it? She's slightly conscious that I copy her. It's a tr- it's a little tragic, isn't it, that I do copy no, her? No, I think it's very sweet, as long as she thinks it's sweet. She's very patient, let's put it like that. We went on a trip together um, to Australia. I did a, a series of book talks in Australia just before Christmas. And uh, and I said, you know, God, I, it would be so nice to travel with someone. It would be so nice to have, a, have someone there with me. And I suddenly thought, oh, a 15-year-old assistant. That's perfect. So I took her out of school for two, two weeks. She was brilliant. It was an amazing trip, really, really educational. What a great experience It was for fantastic. Her. It was fantastic. But I was doing a big, big book talk in front of quite a big audience. And I was putting on my makeup. And I thought, you know, I thought, I'm quite experienced at putting on makeup, for God's sakes. She said, Mum, what are you doing? I said, what? She said, that, that's concealer you're putting on your, <laughs> eye, on your eyelids. And I said, oh, isn't that where it's meant to go? And she was like, no. She just like was appalled, appalled. What, what teens do. don't know about makeup is... I know, a, I know. And I realised I didn't know a damn thing about makeup after that. Anyway, that we did laugh. Great. I can't help but notice you've got a beautiful brooch on the lapel of your jacket. Yes, I think that's the sort of... That goes with the yin and the yang of the Birkenstocks. That really is the yin and the yang. So on my jacket, I have got a very pretty brooch that says Onisorki Malipons. And it was, um, it was given to me by, by now... The king. It's so strange. That's to quite say a that. statement, India. I know. And do you know what? I used to keep these things sort of hidden away in safes and jewelry boxes and thinking they could only come out on very special occasions. Well, I'm now bloody 55 years old. If I'm not going to wear my lovely bits of jewelry now, when am I ever going to wear them? I completely so I think, agree with that bring theory. Out, bring out the brooch with the Birkenstock. And, and actually, brooch with the Birkenstock, brooch, diamond brooch with jeans, perfect. Good. I'm glad it's got your stamp of approval. Um, You grew up in a household where style was all around you. Do you remember style and taste being important to you, you know, when it became important to you personally? You're right. It it was absolutely everywhere. My, you know, my father, David Hicks, was one of the leading decorators and designers of the 60s and 70s, and he set the world alight with his ideas, and it was never clashing colours, only ever vibrating. But, you know, we would have breakfast in tented rooms there wasn't a hint of daylight in these rooms um and and just amazing amazing sets that really he designed for us to live in and we had a very fantastic house um in the english countryside and you know we had a there was a an old chapel that he converted into a dining room and it was all with red satin curtains and it was just drama everywhere but i have to say david hicks house was very livable but i assumed that everybody's house looked like that. I assumed everybody's father was an interior decorator. I assumed every father designed their own dancing shoes with a red heel, I'd have to say. Was he super dapper too? He was super dapper, super dapper. So I was very surprised when I came to the age of realisation that other people's fathers were actually dentists and farmers and they didn't have red heel dancing shoes. That was a shock. Um, But I've never been formally trained. I went to art school for a brief moment and I took a degree in photography, but I think a lot of the DNA of my style definitely comes from living under the imposing eye of David Hicks. Um, and I always laugh and say he designed everything around him, including my mum's hairdo. You know, it's big. It's I was going to say, did, did he have an impact on what your mother wore? Absolutely. Or was she... No, no, absolutely. And my mother is, is, is an extraordinary person, um, unbelievably well-read. She's fascinating. She has a very open mind. She's very progressive in the way that she thinks which is all remarkable considering she came from um uh well actually it was quite a unique background and her parents were very different um but she traveled a great deal and she lived and she learned and and she's always been very forward thinking um but she just said why why am i going to get involved with design or style when david can do it all for me so she would just wait and so she let herself be dressed by him styled by him yep absolutely And did he style you as a young girl? No, but we were allowed at a certain age to design our own rooms, and but obviously using David Hicks fabrics, clearly. And he would have, you know, quite a comment or two about about the way they looked. I mean, he just was passionate about design, every form of design. That's that's wonderful. Do you remember the first time where you wore something that really? changed how you felt that you realized the power of clothes do you remember what that was i i you know and this is i sort of reference that 
wedding, that wedding. I mean, one, one can't fail to reference it now because because of everything that unfolded afterwards and because of where we are in history right now. It was a and because, huge moment. Because it was a huge moment. And, and I look back and I think about that. It, first, it was the 1980s, so it was a, a boom moment. And you know only too well what was happening in the 1980s. And you were 13 I at the time. I was 13, I was young. But I think my point there was... I, I was quite a tomboy. I'd lived in the English countryside. I'd been a boarding school all my life. I was riding bareback on ponies. I'd never really thought about the way either that I looked or what I was wearing. And suddenly I was put into a very uh, 1980s, over-the-top, puffball dress. Frock. Yes. And it was like, oh, my God. And now looking back, you realize a billion people watched you in that moment. <sighs> Not only did I do that, wear the dress, obviously... And I was so excited to be part of that. And I was so honoured to have been asked and invited. And it was just, it was amazing. Huge moment for a 13-year-old. But, but that fashion moment was was perhaps not my style in general. So looking back, I think, goodness, there I was in that frilly dress. And the shoes were buttercup yellow satin. And they came from a shop on, um, on Bond Street. And I'll never forget, it was called Ivory. It's probably still there. And Ivory wrote to all the bridesmaids afterwards and said, we were allowed to go and choose a pair of shoes. I'd never been given anything, anything and like that. And what did you choose? I think I chose like a loafer, a kind of boyish loafer, inevitably. Back to your roots. Back, exactly, back to my roots. I mean, funnily enough, having grown up in this you know, very, very privileged life of incredible homes, I was very unspoiled. My mother never spoiled us, so I was made to wear hand-me-down clothes from lots of different cousins who'd worn them, and we had to really wait for a birthday or Christmas till a big present came, or it wasn't even a big present. So to get a free pair of shoes just randomly felt like an extraordinary moment. Talking about just back to that dress for a moment, did you get to keep it? Yes. Oh, my yes. goodness, and where yes. is it? Oh, no, well, I shouldn't even ask you no, that. No, no, do ask, do ask, because it's rather lovely, actually. I... Um, my mother happened to be a bridesmaid to the Queen. Um, and I think, yes. I think we're probably quite unique in being a mother and daughter yeah. uh, to royal bridesmaids, God knows. Anyway, it, it's, it, that's not the important part. The important part is the fashion moment of my mother's bridesmaid's dress and mine. They were both um, um, in the museum at Broadlands, my grandfather's house in, uh, in Rumsey, which was open to the public. And now actually they've both come back to us. Um, and I found my mother's in the cellar at home. I said, no. In Mom. the cellar? Yes, please. Because, because, of course, she said, you know, neatly packed up in tissue paper, kept very, get very out of the light, kept yeah. away, rather like the brooches. Um, and I said, no, let's put... So we've got them in Perspex boxes sitting st side by side. I mean, you've worked in and around the fashion industry for so many years. But when do you feel you really discovered your style DNA? I think it changes. You know, you go through so many chapters of life. Well, I certainly have. I've lived in different cities. I've lived in different uh, places in the world that aren't necessarily cities. And, and I think I've, I've, I've always been the same person, probably. But, but the, the, the context of the story around you changes. So there was a moment where I thought, you know, I need to be more high fashion. And then that was a very brief moment. It didn't last very long. And then I realized I... I really, you know, I love fashion. I love it, love it, love it, love it. But it is much, much less important in my life now. Um, and I think, oddly, having been a model for, for a number of years, you were dressed, you made no decisions yourself. So, in fact, you always just reverted back to getting into your jeans and getting in your sweater and travelling to the next location or shoot. So you didn't really actually give fashion that much thought because it was being thought through for you. And then you become a mum, and I became a mum far too many times, um, and so then life just sort of, it takes over and you're less thinking about yourself. There's less of those selfish moments. And I think with that, there's less selfish fashion moments. So now I just like to be comfortable. And I think we're in a really great moment in fashion where you can be anything and anyone you want to be. I can go to a meeting, a serious meeting in London wearing a pair of Birkenstocks and get away with it. I know. It's, it's really refreshing, yeah. isn't it? I mean, obviously you made a big fashion decision two years ago when you married your partner um, and father of your children. Um, how did you go about choosing that dress? Which I have to say, before you even start, glorious. You looked absolutely the epitome of chic on your wedding day. Oh my goodness, that's really, really nice to hear. Thank you. Um, it, was, it was, you know, it was the first time I was getting married, David's first time. 
Um, it was just a wonderful day. And someone said to me, it'll be the happiest day of your life. I thought, oh, God, that's just corny crap. It actually strangely yeah. really was. One, it looked it wonderful day of my pictures. life. It was so fantastic. I have all five of my kids really involved in every step of the process. Uh, process sounds so awful. But I had sort of, you know, shied away from marriage for so long. Not that I was worrying about whether I needed to be married to David, but I just didn't think it was something I needed to do. And then after COVID, things changed, and I felt my children were questioning how the world was going to be and how was life going to move forward. And I thought, what can I do that's really anchoring for them? And I thought, I know. Why don't we get married? That feels like it's something very traditional. And it, I just love it. I love being married. I love saying this is my husband. Oh, it feels that's so lovely. nice. It really does. But the dress was quite a conundrum. I mean, I was 54, and to get married at 54, you've got to be careful because you don't want to look quite like an idiot. Um, so I thought I didn't want to wear long. I knew I wanted to get married in a church, which is strange because I, I don't spend a huge amount of time in church, but I wanted it to be very traditional. It's where my father's buried. It was where I was christened. So I wanted a dress that was appropriate for church, which yeah. is my point, and not getting married barefoot on a beach. Um, I wanted something that felt traditional but a little modern and Amelia Wickstead and I um, have worked together for, in the past and I think she really understands my body type and me and all that. and we just had a wonderful time doing it and she showed me a bit of lace and I just said yes straight away and I knew that that was going to be the foundation of it and once you had an incredible fabric then the rest could be very very simple and it's the one time that I've really really sort of invested in something and, and I suddenly realized what couture meant. And I suddenly realized when it's fitted to you, the difference. My it was God. flawless, yeah. the fit well, on that dress. Hard. It really, that was Amelia. really was. So you played around with the neck of the dress. Yes, because Amelia wanted drama. I think she wanted, you know, she felt that it would be very, very stylish and high drama to have a high, high neck. And at first I was, I was going with her down that path. And then I suddenly thought, no, this is... This is not the time for drama. I didn't want that. I just wanted to be, I just, I just wanted to be me. And yet you chose to wear a veil. I did, and I debated that for a while too, because I was nervous again. How ridiculous would I look at 54 wearing a virginal veil? Because Amanda, I have to tell you, that ship has sailed. Well, you have the virgin ship sailed. Yes, you yeah. have the, the yeah. kids to show it. Yeah. So, so, but then I thought, actually, you know what? It would be nice to wear a veil. I'm only going to get one chance in my life to yeah. wear a cream veil, and this is it. Yeah, and I, and I love that. I love the fact that your older son walked you down the aisle and that he presented you to David and lifted your veil. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Oh. And he did very well. With all his tattoos over his hands, in his beautiful tailored suit, he did manage to lift that veil, and he did it so nicely. Would you say you've got specific standout outfits in your life that you can think of real specific? I mean, obviously your wedding dress, obviously your bridesmaid dress when you when Lady Diana married Prince Charles. Um, but are there any others that, that immediately spring to mind as just being very powerful moments? May, maybe much more low-key moments, but... No, I think, you know, I've, I, I, I've lived so many different lives and in so many different places, and the geography of that um, normally dictates kind of how you're dressing and why you're dressing in a certain way. So I wouldn't say so, but I do definitely have some real moments where I look back and I think, what, what was I thinking? Much less than, wow, that was so amazing. I'm ashamed to say. Do you have a worst fashion moment in particular? No, I have too of? many of them. There are a lot of worst fashion moments. There are a lot of worst fashion hairdos too. Well, I never think of you as... I, I always think of your beautiful, long locks. Yes, well, if you think back to Diana's wedding, that was the worst hair day ever. And again, a billion people watching that. I decided I had had long waist length hair. You were a kid. I'm going to chop it off so I can look more like a boy. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally, who would you say you dress for? Yourself, David, your audience? No, no. If it was for David, I'd be dressed like Grace Kelly every day. That's what he'd like. He'd like a sort oh. of 1940s, 50s So he must have in. loved your wedding he dress. He did. Actually, he did. Thank God. Because he's got great taste, David. And he's, he always says things to me like, why are you wearing those ugly shoes? He's and very then, dapper, isn't he? He's very he? dapper. And then later I'd look back and think, oh, God, he was right. Why was I wearing those ugly shoes? Um... No, I think, 
I think a lot of women dress for a lot of other women. We, we, we influence each other much more than we dress for men. What do you reach for when you want to feel empowered? I love heels. I do love heels. I love heels for all sorts of reasons. I, they make me feel that I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm on a mission of some kind. I, I, it's, it's probably so... Um, it's probably so revealing that I would say heels make me feel empowered. Um, I think that's fascinating, and I think it's very true. I think a lot of us could relate to that. It cert they certainly change how we hold ourselves, yeah. how we walk. There's perhaps a little bit of a wiggle that creeps Definitely. in Definitely. If I walk into a restaurant dressed as I am now, and not many people can look, if I walk into a restaurant with a pair of killer heels on with exactly the same outfit yes i think yeah. people look i yeah. think people look men and women um and it is nice to be it is nice to be noticed when you want to be noticed it's also nice to get on the underground and have no one notice you but i do think that if if i'm going to an event where i'm i'm speaking or if i'm going to an event to listen to somebody you know i i, I like to have a moment where i'm dressed up and a heel definitely finishes it off it completes it for me where's your go-to heel well, supplier well, uh, Christian Louboutin is a great mate of mine. I knew him before he was even doing shoes. He was a garden designer. We were living um, in Paris. And he said, this is fantastic. I'm going to learn to speak English. And I said, I'm fantastic. I'm going to learn to speak French. He speaks very good Franglais. I don't speak a word of French. <laughs> I actually speak some French, but not good French. Um, and we've been really, really good friends. And it's just been amazing watching him. And it's, it's amazing to see such a good, nutty, bonkers friend succeed to the level that he has and that is through not just his unbelievable creativity but but just bloody damn hard work which you know only too well because you were telling me earlier about the 30 years the grind of it the the, en the energy that you have to put into that um, and it's a hustle it is a hustle but Christian just has this innate amazing character where he is actually highly intelligent very well read. He explores things. He's curious. He travels the world. And he's always exciting. He's always exciting to be around. And I think that's reflected in his brand. So when I wear his shoes, I feel all of that. I feel the fun and the energy and the timelessness uh, of Christian. And chapeau to him because the comfort too. I mean, there aren't many designers who, who design heels as comfortably as, as he does, I think. Yes. Perhaps you're having a better experience than me. Oh, They're right. They're bloody uncomfortable. Oh, no. Him and but Manolo. I, I, I think Manolo's are just sublime. I will sublime. still go for them. But did, even the hell of them are still wearing. Did you wear them on your wedding day? I did. Oh, fabulous. Yes, I did. So white shoes with a yes. red sole. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you have a style icon? I had a very amazing grandmother, and I never met her. Um, Edwina Mountbatten, and she was um, she was a, a great heiress, so she could afford extraordinarily beautiful clothes, and she went to Paris to have her wardrobe made, and she had ha ha her shoes all handmade. But then she became a very different woman later in her life, and the war changed her completely, mm. and she found, she found um, that her skill sets of organization could be put into very good use. Um, and she went out to the Japanese war camps and was there before anybody else explaining that war had finished and that How freedom was coming. How interesting that she was out on the, the sort of front of, uh, in, in the wars and you're now actually yes, doing... Yes, in a, in, a, in a much less way. But she was, she was really sensational. I think she was a very difficult mum. And I think my mother and aunt definitely didn't have a cosy mother and they... She wasn't there much, but that also is a generation and a I, time. I was going to say, I think that was quite generational too, wasn't but it? But when I look at her as Viceroy of India, and again, it's a, it's a time and a place in history that won't repeat itself ever again, she was extremely elegant, very, very elegant. And I see some of those early pictures of her. You know, she, I was just in Palm Springs and, and went to see Charlie Chaplin's house, and my grandparents were out there on their honeymoon, and they made a film of Charlie Chaplin. And when I looked, at, I went to them, Parthay Films, to have a look at it, and my grandmother, she was just so beautifully dressed and just, it was an amazing time. So I think she would have been a remarkable woman to have seen, just not only from her wardrobe to her shoes, but to her jewels. The way they had these extraordinary jewels and she had these earrings 
which twisted so that it, it, was, it was a diamond base and you could twist it and then you would have the emerald come through or the ruby come through oh. or the sapphire come through, depending on what you were wearing. I mean, amazing. Has your style changed through the decade, decades? Fundamentally, I'm probably a pretty lazy dresser. Um, oh, I don't think so. I've never seen any evidence oh, of I that. Oh, I love that. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. Um, <laughs> But uh, there is there is now, you know, uh, God, I mean, jeans are just the, the, the core and the backbone to any wardrobe that I'm with. I travel so much, and now I try to travel with carry-on only because travel is such a headache. Um, and so I pack with great consideration. So I'll, I'll map out the kind of days and where, I'm do where I am at and what I'm doing, and I try to map the wardrobe to that. But I think rather similar to you, and I always look to see what you're wearing. I go to your... Instagram and look to see what's how's Amanda dressing. I, I like the I like the tone on tone. I love that. And I think that that's a that's a very I think that's a very beautiful and elegant way to get through life is just all creams, all greys, all blacks. It works. It it makes life a lot yeah. easier, particularly with your peripatetic lifestyle and in and out of a, a suitcase, my goodness. Um, is age a consideration of how you dress? Yes, more and more. You know, as I've said, I'm now 55. And yeah, I can't believe I'm 55. How did that even happen? I don't mind being 55 at all. I'm just stunned to but discover it's quite it. it's shocking. It's so shocking. The how did life just whiz by so quickly? It's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. Um, but I am enjoying life a lot. Um, and I think there is something very comforting about getting to this age where you can kind of feel more confident about yourself and where you're going and who you've been and who you want to become and with that I think comes clothing as well you're more confident in where you're going to what you're going to wear and and how you're going to wear it but I am more aware you know as I said I slightly do copy my daughter because she's got great taste um but I also think oh no I cannot wear that crop top which of course she can wear so easily so I'm I am aware I'm more aware do you have one item of clothing that means the most to you I have a North Face jacket that I was just thinking about the other day that I must have had since I was about 18 or 19. And, and again, uh, that's a reflection on the brand of how it's kind of kept going. But now my kids want to wear North Face because it's kind of, you know, super cool. hip, hip and cool. Um, and that I still wear this jacket. And I, I just, I've just, it's just been with me in every moment of my life, and I always revert back to it. I've got an old barber that I've worn for years and years and years and years, and the pockets are coming out, and, you know, it used to carry cartridges for the guns and no longer, but now everything just slides out the bottom of the pocket. I've got a Burberry Mac of my mum's that she wore riding, and I just, I can feel the texture of the Burberry Mac and how it's been worn over the years, and I just, I love that coat, so I'll never... Get rid of it. I don't wear it, but I'll never get rid of it just because I can smell and feel her on horseback. I love the way some of those pieces that maybe we don't wear anymore, but they still tell stories. Yeah. Have you ever used a stylist? Never. Um, never, which is possibly a mistake too. But because stylists just, they, they're just brilliant in being able to access new and different ways of thinking about yourself, and they're probably more tapped into, you know, what's up and coming, which I love, and I that might go unnoticed by me. Um, but I don't. I, I think well, some of the bigger occasions that I've been to, I'm lucky to be able to call up a designer and ask if I might borrow. Um, I used to be slightly ashamed of that, like, oh, I'm not buying my own clothes, I'm borrowing. Now I'm very thrilled by that because it means that I'm not... That, that there's less waste it's someone else it can be reused by someone else and yeah. goes back to them it goes in their samples so I, I, I like to borrow if I can um, I went to a Prince's Trust um, uh, gala I think the Americans call it a gala in, in um, New York and again I was like firstly quite horrified the idea there was even going to be a gala what are we doing in black tie it was just after COVID actually I was completely wrong it was a huge success a great deal of money was raised and more importantly awareness of what the Prince's Trust was doing and I called Naeem Khan and I said, could I borrow something? Because he's in New York and he's a good friend. And Naeem, I just, I love, I love Naeem and a bit of sparkle. Um, and again, he just, his clothes fit my body type. And I think there's something to be said for that when you don't even need to try it on. I can look at it on a page. Do you subscribe to the hashtag rewear don't care? 
Yes, very much. I also so obviously, you've got a huge presence on social media, 362,000 followers and counting. Oh, that's nice to know. Um, I do subscribe to that. Um, I think um, the Princess of Wales, Catherine, is a very good example to us all. We just saw her in the BAFTA. An incredible, incredible example. And, and, and I think that, 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 you know, in the day and age that we're living in, that, that is important. I also subscribe to um, uh, Adopt, Don't Buy for dogs. Um, and uh, I live on Harbour in the Bahamas, and we've got a, a lot of dogs that need adopting at the moment. Um, so we're always trying to encourage visitors um, to adopt, don't shop. Take them home. Yeah. I mean, as an influencer of your standing, as well as being many other things, um, do you get showered with freebies? I'm very careful about that, yes, um, because that is just the way the world's moving yep. in its strange and, and mysterious way, that when you have a certain audience, and it, I think the number is more irrelevant, it's the engagement, and, and if, the, if, there's a, if there's a sort of ongoing conversation between you and the people you're, you're chatting to, then brands get excited and they want you to be talking about their things. And I think, and I think that works. I think it works for everybody. If I am able to find a new brand or, as I say, a, a J. Crew shirt or a pair of jeans that you then say, oh, I love those, why not? But I'm very careful to make sure that I feel I can give back as much to the brand as, as the clothing that they're giving to me, uh, that they are a compelling part of my story, that there's integrity to it, and that I, that I really actually do love what I am accepting let's put it like that but I am careful and, and brands will often write and say would you like and 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 I don't if I feel that I can't honestly say I love this and I'm gonna wear it what do you do with your pieces when you've had enough of them um lots of different things um uh I I, I think that there is that there is a a charity shop um, near Wallingford, where I live, that is filled with uh, with a lot of wonderful clothing. David shops in it. It's very funny. I go and put my clothes in there, and David shops in the shop and comes back with clothes. Ooh, give yeah. us the name. It's very funny. And um, in the Bahamas, obviously, there's uh, there are a lot of uh, people who are very happy to have um, uh, lovely hand-me-downs. Um, I have a daughter, uh, although she's she's more specific about it. Um, so yes, so I, I, whenever I take something, I think, you know, who could this go to? Where will this end up? Um, and, and I think that's a lovely thing nowadays that we're also proud that we pass our clothes on or that we accept clothes that are being passed on to us. Very true. Do you have a, a brand that's a guilty secret? I don't have a brand necessarily. Um, but there's a lot of beautiful jewellery that I think is wearable jewellery. Just, again, in Verbier, uh, Danielle Draper. Um, brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. Good. I was waiting to hear what you were about to say because you went... Yeah. <gasps> no, I love what she does because she does. A, she uses a lot of recycle. She does. She? It's all recycled and it's a mother and daughter team, which yeah. I love as well. Um, and again, it's it's all personalised. You can have an, an engraved on it. So I, I love I love the story behind that. So I'm happy to be wearing someone's jewellery when there's such a lovely story and it's a sustainable story and it's a mother daughter story. Yeah, so true. A high street favourite. You know, I do have to confess that I wear a lot of Zara. Um, which is probably, that is probably the real guilty, not even secret, because I'll say it, but it's just that it's a guilt because I su suspect it's not all um, as as lovingly above board as we think. Um, but it's easy. It's very easy. You and it's clever. Yeah. But does it ever bother you that... It might not be as sustainable. Yes, it does. It bothers me a lot. But again, I, I, I like to think that when I buy from there, that the, the, what I'm buying is going on to other homes. What, if anything, do you feel you've got an excessive amount of in your wardrobe? Bikinis. Well, you live on an island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are you a bikini girl? I am. Good girl. Most expensive item you've ever bought? Very hard. Um, I am carrying not an excessively expensive bag, but one that I've designed, and it's one of the more expensive bags on the Tusting website. And I work with Tusting, and it's a brand I absolutely love. Um, 1875, they've been in the same family. And I work with Mr. and Mrs. Tusting. I make them sound like they're crusty old 
oldies, but they're not at all. They're wonderful. And they have a workshop where they make the bags downstairs. They make to order. So they're down no in way. Somerset, aren't they? They're actually in Bedford. Oh, are they? Yeah. Why did I think Somerset? I don't know. Nope. Okay. So there is, there is no waste whatsoever. You don't have to place huge orders and worry about forecasting anyway. Um, but the bag I've designed is unbelievably simple. It's delicious leather. There's a very good sustainable story to it. Um, but it is an expensive item uh, for the everyday person. But it's, I think, one of those lifetime purchases. And I just, I love the bag. And the Tustings have loved making the bag. And it's definitely one of the more expensive bags on their website, if that counts. I think we're going to go to quickfire questions. Oh, God. So, are you ready? Mm -hmm. What fashion advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Not to sweat it too much. It will change. Which fashion trend would you like to see make a comeback? Oh, I do love a 1950s tight waist and a big skirt. Which fashion or beauty trend would you consign to room 101? God, so many clogs. <laughs> your last impulse buy? Uh, sports gear. Always way too much sports gear, but I do love performance fabrics. Views on tattoos? I have a kid covered in them, one kid. Um, I caution the others. Uh, if they ever went to their faces, I disinherit them, disown them, never see them again. But I think that they are a trend, and that's okay if they want to express themselves like that. Do you have one? I don't. Beauty treatment you couldn't give up? I use Augustus Bada. Love it. Um, it's definitely an investment, but I do think there's some kind of magic in there. High end or high street? High street. Bling or bear? Bear. Minimalism or maximalism? I minimalist in a maximalist way. Good answer. Crocs, cute or puke? Oh, puke now. Sneakers or stilettos? Both. Bags or shoes? Bags. Skinnies or boyfriends or wide legs? All. Bodycon or boho? Boho. Sports Lux or Rock Chick? Oh, sports Lux. Red carpet or relax? <sighs> You've made me hesitate. It's been a while for a red carpet, but it is so lovely to have that moment. Cashmere or cotton? Cashmere. Shapewear or sexy lingerie? Sexy lingerie. Tights or stockings? Well, I go tights, David goes stockings. <laughs> Bikini or one piece? Bikini. Trilby or Tracy? Trilby. And finally, at the end of the day, what do you or don't you wear in bed? <laughs> what a fun answer. David always says I wear more in bed than I do in the daytime. <laughs> He's terribly disappointed that his wife has turned into this person. I like to be cosy at night. Even in the Bahamas? Even in the Bahamas. India, what a wonderful romp through your style journey. I could have, honestly, I could carry on for hours and hours, but I'd probably bore everyone to tears. But thank you so much for coming here and spending this time with me today. What fun. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Really feel like such an honour to sit here. Oh, what fun. Brilliant.